chapter 43, a higher experience. We need constantly a fresh revelation of Christ, a daily experience that harmonizes with his teachings. High and holy attainments are within our reach. Continual progress in knowledge and virtue is God's purpose for us. His law is the echo of his own voice, giving to all the invitation, come up higher, be holy, holier still. Every day we may advance in perfection of Christian character. Those who are engaged in service for the Master need an experience much higher, deeper, broader than many have yet thought of having. Many who are already members of God's great family know little of what it means to behold His glory and to be changed from glory to glory. Many have a twilight perception of Christ's excellence and their hearts thrill with joy. They long for a fuller, deeper sense of the Saviour's love. Let these cherish every desire of the soul after God. The Holy Spirit works with those who will be worked, moulds those who will be moulded, fashions those who will be fashioned. Give yourselves the culture of spiritual thoughts and holy communings. You have seen but the first rays of early dawn of His glory. As you follow on to know the Lord, you will know that the path of the righteous is as the light of the dawn that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Proverbs 4 verse 18 These things have I spoken to you, said Christ, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. John 15 11. Ever before him Christ saw the result of his mission, his early life, so full of toil and self-sacrifice, was cheered by the thought that he would not have all this travail for naught. By giving his life for the life of men, he would restore in humanity the image of God. He would lift us up from the dust, reshape the character after the pattern of his own character, and make it beautiful with his own glory. Christ saw of the travail of his soul and was satisfied. He viewed the expanse of eternity and saw the happiness of those who through his humiliation should receive pardon and everlasting life. He was wounded for their transgressions, bruised for their iniquities. The chastisement of their peace was upon him and with his stripes they were healed. He heard the shout of the redeemed he heard the ransomed one singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Although the baptism of blood must first be received, although the sins of the world were to weigh upon his innocent soul, although the shadow of an unspeakable woe was upon him, yet for the joy that was to set before him, he chose to endure the cross and despised the shame. This joy all his followers are to share. However great and glorious hereafter, our reward is not all to be reserved for the time of final deliverance. Even here we are by faith to enter into the Saviour's joy. Like Moses, we are to endure as seeing the invisible. Now the church is militant. Now we are confronted with a world in darkness, almost wholly given over to idolatry. In the words of the hymn, The Joy of the Lord, Elizabeth Clefani writes, There were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold, but one was out on the hills away, far, far from the gates of gold. Away on the mountains wild and bare, Away from the tender shepherd's care. Lord, thou hast here thy ninety and nine, Are they not enough for thee? 
But the shepherd made answer, One of mine has wandered away from me. And although the road be rough and steep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. But none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. Far out in the desert he heard its cry, fainting and helpless and ready to die. Lord, whence are these blood drops all the way that mark out the mountain's track? They were shed for the one who had gone astray, ere the shepherd could bring him back. Lord, why are thy hands so rent and torn? They were pissed tonight by many a thorn. But all through the mountains thunder riven, and up from the rocky steep, there rose a cry to the gate of heaven, Rejoice, I have found my sheep. And the angels sang around the throne, Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Ellen White continues, But the day is coming when the battle will have been fought and the victory won. The will of God is to be done on earth as it is done in heaven. The nations of the saved will know now no other law than the law of heaven and will be a happy united family clothed with the garments of praise and thanksgiving, the robe of Christ's righteousness. All nature in its surpassing loveliness will offer to God a tribute of praise and adoration. The light of the moon will be as the light of the sun and the light of the sun will be sevenfold greater than it is now. The years will move on in gladness. Over the scene, the morning stars will sing together and the sons of God will shout for joy while God and Christ will unite in proclaiming, there shall be no more sin, neither shall there be any more death. These visions of future glory, scenes pictured by the hand of God, should be dear to his children. Stand on the threshold of eternity and hear the gracious welcome given to those who in this life have cooperated with Christ. Regarding it as a privilege and an honour to suffer for his sake, with the angels they cast their crowns at the feet of the Redeemer, explaining, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. Honour and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. Revelation 5 verses 12 and 13. There the redeemed ones greet those who directed them to the uplifted Saviour. They unite in praising him who died that human beings might have the life that measures with the life of God. The conflict is over. All tribulation and strife are at an end. Songs of victory fill all heaven as the redeemed stand around the throne of God. All take up the joyful strain. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain and hath redeemed us to God. I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Revelation 7, verse 9 and 10. These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, 
nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Verses 14 to 17 and chapter 21 verse 4. We need to keep ever before us this vision of things unseen. It is thus that we shall be able to set a right value on the things of eternity and the things of time. It is this that will give us power to influence others for the higher life. Subheading, In the Mount with God Come up to me in the mount God bids us. To Moses, before he could be God's instrument in delivering Israel, was appointed the forty years of communion with him in the mountain solitudes. Before bearing God's message to Pharaoh, he spoke with the angel in the burning bush. Before receiving God's law as the representative of his people, he was called into the mount and beheld his glory. Before executing justice on the idolaters, he was hidden in the cleft of the rock, and the Lord said, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness and truth, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Exodus 33, 19, chapter 34, verse 6 and 7. Before he laid down with his life, his burden for Israel, God called him to the top of Pisgah and spread out before him the glory of the promised land. Before the disciples went forth on their mission, they were called up into the mount with Jesus. Before the power and glory of Pentecost came the night of communion with the Saviour, the meeting on the mountain in Galilee, the parting scene upon Olivet with the angel's promise and the days of prayer and communion in the upper chamber. Jesus, when preparing for some great trial or some important work, would resort to the solitude of the mountains and spend the night in prayer to his Father. A night of prayer preceded the ordination of the apostles and the Sermon on the Mount the transfiguration, the agony of the judgment hall and the cross, and the resurrection glory. Subheading, the privilege of prayer. We, too, must have time set apart for meditation and prayer and for receiving spiritual refreshing. We do not value the power and efficacy of prayer as we should, Prayer and faith will do what no power on earth can accomplish. We are seldom in all aspects placed in the same position twice. We continually have new scenes and new trials to pass through, where past experience cannot be a sufficient guide. We must have the continual light that comes from God. Christ is ever sending messages to those who listen for his voice. On the night of the agony in Gethsemane, the sleeping disciples did not hear the voice of Jesus. They had a dim sense of the angel's presence, but lost the power and glory of the scene. Because of their drowsiness and stupor, they failed of receiving the evidence that would have strengthened their souls for the terrible scenes before them. Thus today, the very men who most need divine instruction often fail of receiving it because they do not place themselves in communion with heaven. The temptations to which we are daily exposed make prayer a necessity. Dangers beset every path. Those who are seeking to rescue others from vice and ruin are especially exposed to temptation. In constant contact with evil, they need a stronghold upon God, lest they themselves be corrupted. 
short and decisive are the steps that lead men down from high and holy ground to a low level. In a moment, decisions may be made that fix one's condition forever. One failure to overcome leads the soul unguarded. One evil habit, if not firmly resisted, will strengthen into chains of steel, binding the whole man. The reason why so many are left to themselves in places of temptation is that they do not set the Lord always before them. When we permit our communion with God to be broken, our defense is departed from us. Not all your good purposes and good intentions will enable you to withstand evil. You must be men and women of prayer. Your petitions must not be faint occasional and fitful, but earnest, persevering and constant. It is not always necessary to bow upon your knees in order to pray. Cultivate the habit of talking with the Saviour when you are alone, when you are walking and when you are busy with your daily labour. Let the heart be continually uplifted in silent petition for help, for light, for strength for knowledge. Let every breath be a prayer. As workers for God, we must reach men where they are, surrounded with darkness, sunken in vice and stained with corruption. But while we stay our minds upon Him, who is our sun and our shield, the evil that surrounds us will not bring one stain upon our garments. As we work to save the souls that are ready to perish, we shall not be put to shame if we make God our trust. Christ in the heart, Christ in the life, this is our safety. The atmosphere of his presence will fill the soul with abhorrence of all that is evil. Our spirit may be so identified with his that in thought and aim, we shall be one with him. It was through faith and prayer that Jacob, from being a man of feebleness and sin, became a prince with God. It is thus that you may become men and women of high and holy purpose, of noble life, men and women who will not for any consideration be swayed from truth, right and justice. All are pressed with urgent cares burdens and duties. But the more difficult your position and the heavier your burdens, the more you need Jesus. It is a serious mistake to neglect the public worship of God. The privileges of divine service should not be lightly regarded. Those who attend upon the sick are often unable to avail themselves of these privileges because they should be careful not to to absent themselves needlessly from the house of worship. In ministering to the sick, more than in any merely secular business, success depends on the spirit of consecration and self-sacrifice with which the work is done. Those who bear responsibilities need to place themselves where they will be deeply impressed by the Spirit of God. You should have as much greater anxiety than do others for the aid of the Holy Spirit and for a knowledge of God as your position of trust is more responsible than that of others. Nothing is more needed in our work than the practical results of communion with God. We should show by our daily lives that we have peace and rest in the Saviour. His peace in the heart will shine forth in the countenance. It will give to the voice a persuasive power. Communion with God will ennoble the character and the life. Men will take knowledge of us as of the first disciples, that we have been with Jesus. This will impart to the worker a power that nothing else can give. Of this power, he must not allow himself to be deprived. We must live a twofold life, a life of thought and action, of silent prayer 
and earnest work. The strength received through communion with God, united with earnest effort in the training, the mind of thoughtfulness and caretaking, prepares one for daily duties and keeps the spirit in peace under all circumstances, however trying. Subheading, the Divine Counselor. When in trouble, many think they must appeal to some earthly friend, telling him their perplexities and begging for help. Under trying circumstances, unbelief fills their hearts and the way seems dark. And all the time there stands beside them the mighty counsellor of the ages, inviting them to place their confidence in him. Jesus, the great burden bearer, is saying, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. Shall we turn from him to uncertain human beings who are as dependent upon God as we are ourselves? You may feel the deficiency of your character and the smallness of your ability in comparison with the greatness of the work. But if you had the greatest intellect ever given to man, it would not be sufficient for your work. Without me, you can do nothing, says our Lord and Saviour. John 15, verse 5. The result of all we do rests in the hands of God. Whatever may be tied, lay hold upon Him with steady, persevering confidence. In your busyness, in companionship for leisure hours, and in alliance for life, let all the associations you form be entered upon with earnest, humble prayer. You will thus show that you honour God, and God will honour you. Pray when you are faint-hearted. When you are despondent, close the lips firmly to men. Do not shadow the path of others, but tell everything to Jesus. Reach up your hands for help. In your weakness, lay hold of infinite strength. Ask for humility, wisdom, courage, increase of faith, that you may see light in God's light and rejoice in His love. Subheading, Consecration and Trust When we are humble and contrite, we stand where God can and will manifest Himself to us. He is well pleased when we urge past mercies and blessings as a reason why He should bestow on us greater blessings. He will more than fulfil the expectations of those who trust fully in Him. The Lord Jesus knows just what His children need, how much divine power He will appropriate for the blessing of humanity. And He bestows upon us all that we will employ in blessing others and ennobling our own souls. We must have less trust in what we ourselves can do and more trust in what the Lord can do for and through us. You are not engaged in your own work. You are doing the work of God. Surrender your will and way to Him. Make not a single reserve, not a single compromise with self. Know what it is to be free in Christ. The mere hearing of sermons, Sabbath after Sabbath, the reading of the Bible through and through, or the explanation of it verse by verse, will not benefit us or those who hear us unless we bring the truths of the Bible into our individual experience. The understanding, the will, the affections must be yielded to the control of the Word of God. Then through the work of the Holy Spirit, the precepts of the Word will become the principles of the life. As you ask the Lord to help you, honour your Saviour by believing that you do receive His blessing. All power, all wisdom are at our command. We have only to ask, walk continually in the light of God, meditate day and night upon His character, then you will see his beauty, 
and rejoice in His goodness. Your heart will glow with a sense of His love. You will be uplifted as if borne by everlasting arms. With the power and light that God imparts, you can comprehend more and accomplish more than you ever before deemed possible. Subheading, Abide in Me. Christ bids us, Abide in Me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. John 15, verse 4 to 16. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Revelation 3, verse 20. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receives it. Revelation 2 verse 17. He that overcomes, I will give him the morning star, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Verses 26 to 28 and chapter 3 verse 12. Subheading. This one thing I do. He who trusts in God will with Paul be able to say, I can do all things in him that strengthens me. Philippians 4 verse 13. Whatever the mistakes or failures of the past, we may, with the help of God, rise above them. With the Apostle we say, This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind me, and reaching forth unto those things which are before me. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, verse 13 and 14. In the words of the hymn, Reginald Heber writes, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God over all, who rules eternity. Holy, 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 angels adore thee, casting down their bright crowns around the glassy sea. Thousands and ten thousands worship low before thee, which wert and art and evermore shall be. Holy, holy, holy. Though darkness hide thee, though the eye of man thy great glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. This is the conclusion of the final chapter of the Ministry of Healing. May God bless you.
You have been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.